Welcome back to Mad Medicine. In this lecture, we're going to be discussing the concept of histone modification. If you haven't already done so, consider subscribing to our YouTube channel because your support really means a lot to us and it allows us to keep these educational videos completely free with no paywall so you can continue learning without going deeper into debt because we understand you're probably in a lot of debt. So with that being said, let's dive right in by first discussing an overview of DNA because DNA is important and it plays an important, um, you know, uh, it plays an important role in your understanding of histones because obviously histones are closely related to DNA. We're going to talk a little bit more about that in a second. What is DNA? DNA essentially is your genetic code. It is the basis of all of the processes that are happening in your body at the cellular level. Now it is usually for the most part, is located in the nuclei of eukaryotic cells. You do have DNA in the mitochondria called the mitochondrial DNA, but in terms of all the processes that are happening, that DNA is located in the nuclei. So in your brain, remember, DNA, nuclei, eukaryotic cells. This is just the basics we're talking about. And DNA is a polymer of nucleotides. Nucleotides are these two things right here. I, I put them right here so you can always remember what they look like. A nucleotide has a ribose sugar backbone. This is a ribose sugar. It has a nitrogenous base attached to it. And it has a phosphate group attached to it. All right. A, and this right here is a deoxyribonucleotide. The only difference between the ribonucleotide and the deoxyribonucleotide is on the second carbon right here. The deoxyribonucleotide has no OH group. There's no hydroxyl group there. Whereas in the ribonucleotide, there is a hydroxyl group on the second carbon. Also, ribonucleotides found in RNA. Deoxyribonucleotides, you guessed it, it's found in DNA. Quick recap. Now, when it comes to our DNA, our DNA is very important. It has to be conserved. It has to be essentially maintained because if it is not, it will get messed up. And the way we conserve DNA, there are many mechanisms, but essentially we have to control one portion of the process of replicating or, or the process of transforming the DNA into proteins. Remember, when we're talking about DNA, our DNA goes through a process called transcription where it becomes RNA and then RNA is translated into proteins. Well, if you have DNA that gets damaged at this region right here, you will get, I'm going to call this messed up RNA, okay? And then that messed up RNA will create a messed up protein. We don't want that. We don't want messed up you know, things happening in our cells. So we have to control this step, the transcription phase. And there are several mechanisms of controlling DNA transcription. One of these mechanisms we've already discussed, and that is DNA methylation. DNA methylation essentially is seen right here. You can add a methyl group onto a, a one of the nitrogenous bases. We have cytosine shown right here. This is the normal structure of cytosine. When you add this methyl group, you make it into methylated cytosine. Okay, DNA methylation, when you methylate these uh, base, these nitrogenous bases, you will decrease DNA transcription. They are inversely related. So increase in methylation, equals decrease in transcription. Okay, pretty straightforward, right? Well, that we've discussed already. Today, we're going to be discussing the concept of histone modifications. And there are two main modifications you need to remember, acetylation and deacetylation, especially when it comes to histones. So now that we're going to be discussing histone modifications, I think it's just prudent that we talk about histones and what they are. Histones are proteins that are found in the chromatin that function to condense DNA. If you look right here, this is a chromosome. And the higher up we go, the deeper we are focusing on the... Uh, uh, or essentially we are magnifying into the chromosome. And if you look right here, this is your histone unit. Your histone unit has five main components. Those five components are the H1 histone component, which is on the outside. That is this component that you're looking at this right here, okay? This is probably the highest yield or the most important component you need to remember because this component is often the one that gets tested on. This is the component that essentially is uh, what you will be asked, which, which component is outside of the DNA or which component is not actually bound into the uh, histone complex. That is the H1 
histone unit. This is high yield AF. AF, I'm sure you can figure that one out. Okay, then you have the H2A, H2B, H3, and H4. These are all inside. Okay, and you have two of these units in the actual histone. So the histones themselves have eight internal units, which are two of the H2A, right? H2A times two, H2B times two, H3 times two, and then H4 times two, plus one external unit, which is the H1. Okay, very important to understand this, uh, this basic structural component of a histone. Now histones are essentially composed of basic amino acids like lysine and arginine. And they are positively charged because they're composed of these amino acids. This allows for easier binding to the negative charge of the DNA, especially at the phosphate backbone. Okay, the histones will bind to the phosphate. So think of it this one, histone, plus phosphate. Now the H1 is important, like we said earlier, because it is the one that is located outside of the nucleosome core. The nucleosome core, remember, is just the DNA and the histones, the internal histones, which are the eight units. Okay, so when we're discussing this concept, when we're discussing the fact that you have the H1 component, you got to remember that the H1 component is the largest subunit and is the most basic in terms of pH. It doesn't look like it's really large right here just because of the way it's drawn, but in terms of the actual size, it's actually the largest subunit of the four that we're discussing, or the five, excuse me. And it actually functions very, uh, it, it has a very important function because the H1 subunit is going to hold the nucleosome together. It is essentially the binding aspect of the histone. It makes sure all the subunits get, get combined. It makes sure that the DNA wraps properly and it makes sure that the nucleosome stays together while condensing those nucleosome segments. That is why this subunit is so freaking important. You cannot have a proper histone function without the uh, without the presence of a well functioning or a well uh, composed H1 subunit. If there is something going on, if there is not proper transcription or translation of you know amino acids to create this protein structure of histones, you will not get proper condensation of your chromosomes and of the DNA. Okay, so now that we've talked about histones and we've discussed what's going on, now we need to start talking about modification of histones. As you can see, histones play a very important part in condensing the DNA, similar to how methylated DNA works, right? We talked about DNA methylation in the previous lecture and we talked about it earlier in this lecture, but when you methylate DNA, it causes the DNA segments to get tighter together and it becomes really hard for transcription factors to bind to that portion of DNA to transcribe it into RNA. Well, histones play a very important role, very similar to this. This image is very important. As you can see, when more and more histones start binding together, you get this really tight structure of DNA. As the DNA binds around the histones and then the histones clump, it becomes more segregated, it becomes more condensed, excuse me. And when it becomes more condensed, it becomes harder for the DNA to get transcripted. Very important because it allows our DNA to remain unaltered. It is essentially a protective mechanism we have developed over time to prevent DNA uh, damage from really occurring. But we also need to be able to undo this process. Just like we need to be able to undo DNA methylation when we need to transcribe something, we need to undo histone modification. We need to undo this packing of histones too. And the way we do that is by modification processes. The first one we're gonna be discussing is going to be histone acetylation. And acetylation is the main one you need to know because deacetylation will just be the opposite of acetylation. So if I were you, I would remember histone acetylation only because deacetylation is the complete opposite of acetylation. All right. So histone acetylation is important because the DNA transcription translation mechanism is very highly conserved. It is a highly conserved because it is important for us to make sure our DNA doesn't get damaged. 
Otherwise, if it gets damaged, we will lead down to the cancer pathway, which our body does not want. So therefore, DNA transcription and translation being highly conserved is an important mechanism for preventing cancer. All right, histone acetylation plays an important role in that. And histone acetylation is one of the most important mechanisms for controlling DNA replication. So what happens is that in the histone acetylation pathway, an acetyl group is added to the lysine on the histone, okay? The lysine gets the acetyl group. Very important, very high yield. Remember this uh, amino acids when you're discussing or when you're thinking about acetylations, okay? How do I remember it? Well, I'm from California, and I always remembered LA histones. Think of like a, I guess, a basketball team called the LA histones. Okay, the lysine gets acetylated on the histone. Pretty stupid, but that's how I remembered it. Hopefully it helps for you. Now, this allows for the relaxation of the chromatin. And when the histone gets uh, acetylated, it is going to essentially kind of fall apart in the way that it will let the, uh, the DNA uh, essentially open up. It'll let the condensed form of DNA loosen up so that transcription factors can essentially get in there. So it is going to relax the chromatin. And when it relaxes the chromatin, transcription can't occur because, like I said, those factors can get in there. They can unravel the DNA, do what they need to, and make some RNA. And then, you know, we can move forward and create the protein. So histone acetylation is essentially the opposite of methylation, DNA methylation. Okay? And I'm going to write that in a second. But what is deacetylation? Deacetylation is exactly like its name you know, implies. In deacetylation, you're going to remove the acetyl group from the histone, from the lysine on the histone, and that's going to essentially undo what it is happening, and it's going to make transcription harder. The way I like to remember it is histones initially or just naturally like to stay in a very condensed state because they like to be with themselves, like to hang out with other histones. So they get closer and tighter and the chromatin becomes closed and it becomes essentially harder for us to transcribe DNA from that type of uh, structure, right? Well, when you add an acetyl group, it is going to cause the histones to separate. But if you remove the acetyl group, they'll just go back to the normal process, the normal baseline that they're at. So deacetylation will make the histone uh, get closer together and it'll make transcription harder. Remember, DNA methylation essentially condenses DNA. Okay and it makes transcription harder. Histone acetylation actually relaxes histones and DNA, and it makes transcription easier. Therefore, DNA methylation is inversely proportional to histone acetylation. They are opposite. Okay, remember that very important concept. And this is what it looks like. This is your normal basic histone. Okay, when your histones are in this normal structure, you are going to have a condensed chromosome. So I like to call this the baseline structure. All right, now, when you add an acetyl group through histone acetyltransferase, HAT, you are going to uh, acetylate all your histones on the, remember, lysine. How do you remember that? Well, think of the LA histones. They are world champions, okay? The LA histones, the, the lysine will get acetylated, okay? And you will essentially relax the DNA structure and that will cause a relaxed chromatin it will allow transcription factors 
to be able to enter and you can get RNA from here. All right. When you remove the acetyl group, okay, you will get an acetyl CoA that will come off and you'll go back to the baseline closed, uh, uh, the closed chromatin structure that you see here. Now, why is all of this important? Well, because there are some clinical context or clinical correlations you need to know. The first one is drug induced lupus. This is a very high yield, high yield concept. We're going to discuss more about this, but in the context of histones, you need to know this concept because it plays a role in histone, uh, uh, acetylation and modification. Essentially drug induced lupus is an autoimmune disorder that's caused by a reaction to medication. Now, this can be essentially a lot of medications that can do this. Now, what is going on in this condition is that it's a very similar condition to systemic lupus erythematosus, except it is not exactly the same. Normal SLE is usually autoimmune mediated. This is going to be caused by a medication that leads to an autoimmune pathway and autoimmune disorder. So the, the insulting culprit in this case is actually the medication. If you take away the medication, oftentimes the DLE, the drug induced lupus can actually go away or you can treat it better. It's much easier to manage, unlike SLE, which can be a lot harder to manage. Now it is commonly caused by these medications right here. There's a lot of medications that do this, but these these are the ones you need to know. Of these ones, the ones I have bolded are the high yield medications you need to commit your mind to, okay? Isoniazid, hydralazine, procainamide. These are very classic medications that will lead to drug induced lupus. Okay, these are the ones that you will be tested on. And in the situation or in the vignette, you'll get a patient who comes in with either a butterfly rash or similar signs of lupus. And you will see in the medication history that they are taking either hyd uh, hydralazine, isoniazid or procanamide. All right. And when you see that and they have no other indication of any previous autoimmune conditions in themselves or in their family, you can deduce that they're discussing a drug induced lupus. Now, how would they test you on the histones? Why would they test you on, you know, a drug induced lupus and how would they tie in histones? Well, in drug induced lupus, you see the presence of antihistone antibodies. That is what's going on. 95% of patients with drug-induced lupus have these antihistone antibodies. And the difference, the reason why I'm saying this is because this is a very high yield fact because it will essentially be, in my opinion, pathognomonic for drug-induced lupus, all right? Because in the classic version of lupus, in the classic SLE, you will see anti-double-strand DNA. But in drug-induced lupus, you will see anti-histone antibodies, all right? So essentially, the way I like to think about it is SLE actually attacks the double-stranded DNA, whereas drug-induced lupus actually attacks the histones. So this is one of the cl clinical correlations of uh, why histones are essentially so important and how messed up processes or processes that interact with these molecules and with these proteins lead to disorders and pathologic states. Another condition is Huntington's disease. This is a movement disorder that is characterized by the abnormal Huntington protein. This is a very important protein because when you have an abnormal Huntington protein, you will see neuronal death in this striatum and that is essentially a gain of function disease. When you have a gain of function disease, they are not able to control their movements. Their movements are able to move all essentially on their own and they don't have the proper ability to stop their movements, okay? That's why we call it a gain of function. Now, there's one mechanism to the Huntington's disease and that is called histone deacetylation, right? In this condition, because you are deacetylating, you are closing up the actual gene and that is gonna lead to decreased transcription as well as gene silencing. And there are portions of, you know, in Huntington's disease that get uh, the, in Huntington's disease of the Huntington protein, the DNA that encodes for the protein gets silenced, that those genes get silenced because of histone deacetylation. That is the one mechanism that is thought to be causing Huntington's disease. So why is this important? When you are deacetylating, you are not going to be able to essentially transcribe the DNA into RNA into the protein you need. So if you have overactive histone deacetylation, essentially pathologic deacetylation, 
those portions of the DNA will not be able to get transcribed. And when those portions can't get transcribed, you will not get a proper functioning protein. Okay. And if you don't know, uh, Huntington's actually has a component that as subsequent generations are born with the disease, the disease gets worse and worse and worse. And that's why more and more of the protein gets less transcribed. It gets less, uh, uh, less produced. And that's why the disease gets worse and worse in subsequent generations. Okay. All because of gene silencing. So that is why histones are so important. So just a quick overview. Histones, the H1 component of the histone is very, very important. Do not forget that. It is on the outside and it allows essentially to hold the nucleosome together and it condenses the nucleosome segments. The way we control histones is essentially uh, modify gene uh, gene activation or even DNA transcription is by acetylating a histone. When you acetylate histones, they will allow the baseline structure of a histone or the baseline structure of a DNA molecule, which is usually very condensed, to loosen up and relax. That will allow transcription factors to go and be able to transcribe certain portions of DNA. Therefore, histone acetylation opens up the DNA. Histone deacetylation closes the DNA. Histone deacetylation is very similar to DNA methylation. DNA methylation, remember, closes and condenses the DNA. Therefore, DNA methylation and histone acetylation are inversely related. One will loosen up, which is acetylation, histone acetylation, and one will condense the DNA, which is DNA methylation. Okay, and histones play a very important role in drug-induced lupus as well as Huntington's disease. So with that being said, I hope this was helpful. If it was, consider subscribing to our channel because your support means a lot to us. It lets us keep this content completely free for your educational purposes. And if you want to see more educational videos like this, go to our website, www.madmedicine.org, where we have cataloged all the uh, topics we are working on and that we are releasing. So you can learn more all for free so you don't go more into debt. Thank you so much.